to. So again, I'm the product line manager for the Tomahawk family. So before I get into Tomahawk 5, just a bit of background on Broadcom. A uh, very long history in semiconductors. So started back in the early 60s with HP and Bell Labs. You know, through a series of mergers, acquisitions with LSI Logic and Broadcom Corporation, we became Broadcom Inc. in 2016. Since 2016, we've expanded significantly on the software side through mergers with Brocade, CA, and Symantec. So now we provide a complete suite of both semiconductor solutions and also software to complement that. So for example, CA would have some monitoring technologies that can be applied to the network. And we have some security, of course, from Symantec. Where we are today is we have 22 category leading semiconductor and infrastructure software divisions. On the semiconductor side, this goes from you know, things as small as like an LED, so those little flashing red and green lights you'll see on the front of your networking equipment. Broadcom provides those. We provide, say, RF filters that are less than a millimeter on a side that can go into cell phones. And we provide components that are you know, some of the largest and most complex chips on the market, such as what we'll be talking about today, Tomahawk 5. We have uh, over 19,000 patents as of last year, revenue of $27.5 billion, and about $5 billion of that goes into R&D. So Broadcom really is a company of engineers. You know, most of the company's engineers, I mean, our sales, marketing, is very thin. And folks aren't directly in engineering. Most of them do have engineering backgrounds. Now getting into networking. So we have products that are specifically focused on the different network, network, networking segments. So enterprise, service provider, and hyperscale data centers. Switch routing products that come from the business unit that I'm in. So that's CSG or the core switching group. Uh, we also have physical layer products. So we have FIs, we have retimers, we have you know, optical DSPs. We also have optical components. So we supply, we manufacture and we um, supply lasers, modulators, and also optical transceivers. So we can provide a complete end-to-end -end solution for networking. And one thing this also allows us to do is provide some very unique solutions, such as we do have a version of Tomahawk 5 and we also introduced or we announced a version of Tomahawk 4 that have co-packaged optics. So the fact that we have all the packaging technology, the switching technology, you know, the linear products with the physical layer and the optics means we can provide that combined component and optimize all the components, provide an integrated solution that either has electrical output or optical output. Now get into the network in silicon. So one thing that does differentiate Broadcom is that we do have domain specific architectures. So we have silicon that's really tuned for the various market segments. So the sweet spot for Trident is the enterprise, Tomahawk is the hyperscalers, and service providers would be the Jericho products. Uh, one thing you do find though is that there is quite a bit of crossover. So whereas the Tomahawk products are really intended for the main fabric within the hyperscalers. We do have some hyperscalers, for example, that would like to use the, or that do use the Trident at the top of rack. They might use the Jericho, some of the features that are in that, that architecture for higher layers in the network, or as Amir will discuss later for AIML. So whereas, you know, the sweet spot for this is, you know, the market segment shown, there is quite a bit of a, a crossover. But the fact that we do tune these to certain markets does mean that we could really fully optimize it for those particular applications. You do see some of our competition that doesn't have quite the breadth of portfolio where they try to have you know, one switch, one router chip that fits into all the market segments. So they just can't get the, you know, the optimizations, they can't get the efficiencies we can having these focused architectures. Now, since we have you know, customers, the hyperscalers, we have OEMs that do use a range of our products. One thing we do to you know, ease their ability, to foster their ability to use these silicon with the same, you know, their same NAS or applications is we provide an SDK that is fully unified for all the product lines. We provide both a Broadcom unified SDK that has open APIs. And we also do provide the switch abstraction interface or SI on top of that. And we also provide a sonic operating system that rests on top of that. So and we actually, within the core switching group, we have about 500 software engineers. 
So even though we are, you know, a silicon group, you know, there is a very, very large software contingent within our business unit. And if you look at the contributions worldwide to Sci and Sonic, you know, following Microsoft that started off the Sonic effort, we're actually the second largest contributor to Sci and Sonic worldwide. Okay, so getting into the subject of today, Tomahawk 5. So this follows a long line of switching products. I mean, what we've seen is that about every two years, we've been doubling the bandwidth. So, you know, over from, you know, 2010 to where we are today, we have an 80x increase in bandwidth. And each generation, we've decreased the power consumption in terms of watts per gigabits per second by about 30%. So we're over 90%, about 95% improved energy efficiency compared to where we were in 2010. And really what allows us to do this is, you know, first off, the very efficient scalable architecture. So you'll see that, you know, in uh, 2014, we bifurcated the Trident line where the Trident, we had to focus more on enterprise. You know, Tomahawk was focusing more on the hyperscalers. And the original Tomahawk architecture, of course, we've made some updates, but we've seen that architecture is very scalable. Um, you know, in each generation, we're updating the process technology. So Tomahawk 5 is a 5 nanometer chip, you know, one of the first chips in the market in 5 nanometer. So Broadcom is always pushing the edge as far as the process technology. You know, one benefit considering the scale of Broadcom is that we have physical IP that is tuned for the specific for networking applications. So the standard cells, the SRAMs, the TCAMs, the SERDIs are all designed specifically for networking. And then finally, physical design expertise. Uh, within our group, we do six to eight switch chips per year. So we have a lot of experience pushing the tools. You know, very often we're pushing the tools to the limit and we're working with the CAD tool companies to advance them past the previous limits. So we have a lot of experience in laying out these chips, making them extremely power efficient. So again, getting into a uh, subject of today, Tomahawk 5, just wanted to first show you the uh, previous generation. So this is the... Uh, Tomahawk 4, this is the OG 25.6T chip. So this is 512 by 50 gigs of PAM4, 50 gig PAM4 lanes. This was followed up by a chip that has 256 100 gig CERTES. So same packet processing, traffic management. We just updated the CERTES for customers that wanted to have native 100 gig PAM4. Follow that up, we have a 12.8T with 50 gig CERTES and a 12.8T with 100 gig CERTES. So, you know, again, this is one thing that Broadcom offers that no one else has is just this level of investment, the number of chips that we put out, you know, even at a certain architecture and a certain process node. Can you pass this around so everybody can take a look at it? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is uh, pass around this next chip. So this is what we're talking about today. So this is Tomahawk 5. This is 60 billion transistors, 51.2 terabits per second. On the back side, there are 9,352 pins. I didn't count that many. <laughs> okay, so getting into Tomahawk 5, you know, some of the uh, salient features. So, you know, although we do support slower port speeds, we really see the main focus of this being 400 giggy and faster. Can I take a picture of this? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Now, we do see that uh, most of the applications would be 400 giggy and faster port speeds. Um, also, we do see a large increase in the amount of usage for uh, of these chips for AI ML. So in particular, we see that the hyperscalers, especially in there, either for their private clouds, for their public clouds, you know, are adding significant hardware oh, to accelerate AI ML. ML. This is double the throughput of any other silicon. I mean, there has been other 51.2T silicon announced before, but you know, our policy at Broadcom is we don't announce silicon until we're actually shipping. So this is the first, by far, first 51.2T on the market. Uh, very low power in terms of watts per gigabit per second. So less than one watt for a 100 gigabit port. And one thing that enables this is some of the factors we talked about on the previous slide. Uh, one thing we didn't mention is this is also, this is monolithic. So, you know, whereas some of our competition has moved to multi-die implementations, even at 12.8T at 16 nanometer, we're still keeping this monolithic. You know, and with that, you get better efficiencies as far as latency, as far as power. As far as the physical connectivity, I mean, one thing that you know, people, you know, they pay a lot of attention to the chip latency, the power, the packet, uh, the, you know, the protocols that it handles. 
you know, one thing we have to understand is that these things they also have to physically interconnect everything in the, the data center efficiently. So we have a very flexible CERTES here that has a very long reach for DAC or copper. Um, it can also be used to drive, of course, front panel pluggables and directly interface to co-packaged optics. And I'll get into that a bit more on subsequent slides. Again, um, AI ML workloads. So we have some features here specifically to you know, accelerate AI ML. You know, I'll touch upon that in this presentation, go into more depth in the next presentation. And then finally, one you know, uh, salient feature that we have is resource virtualization. So you know, single pass VXLAN routing, bridging. You, know, you do see this resource virtual virtualization was of course in, you know, important before for general purpose compute and storage. We also, also are seeing that for AIML where you do want to share those AIML resources. Okay, so you know, again, where does Tomahawk 5 fit into the market? So we see this really driving these higher speed ethernet systems. So if we look here at just the 400 gig ports and faster, you know, what you've seen is that from 2019 to 2022, the number of ports has doubled each year to the point where 15% of the revenue for data center switches is in 400 gig E and faster speed ports. So between now 2022 and 2026, the revenue is expected to increase from 15% to 57%. So by the time we get to 20, you know, 2026, you know, over half of the revenue for data center will be these 400 gig ports and faster. We get into some of the features for that Tomahawk 5 has, especially for you know, the cloud and AI ML in the cloud. Um, so we do have significant telemetry, very flexible telemetry uh, for the cloud. One thing that you know, we see is unique for the cloud is that the type of congestion con control they have to handle is very different than what you would see for say smaller clusters. So they do have these, you know, you know, worldwide, very large cloud where you might have, you know, 15, 17 hops in the network between it. You also see that the type of congestion control that is done I mean, most of the hyperscalers and not just using like straight, you know, TCP, Cubic, Arena. Um, you know, Amazon, we know uses like SRD, you know, Google uses BBR and Swift, um, you know, Alibaba, Microsoft are using HPC, C++. So there's also within those networks, there's a combination of those proprietary schemes, you know, some of them moving into open standards. And then they also have just, you know, some of the open schemes. So you have, you know, TCP, for example, combined with, you know, BBR in a network. So what we're seeing is that, you know, both the type of congestion control that's being used in the network and also the type of components that are going into that network are evolving, you know, constantly evolving. I mean, this congestion control is something that has been evolving for decades and we'll never stop evolving. So, yeah, question. Can you talk a little bit about how, and bring it back to the Tomahawk 5 and specifically mm -hmm. what you've designed on the chip to help with minimizing packet drops and latency? Yeah, so as far as the congestion control, so we'll talk about some of the things like, uh, you know, burst absorption. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's actually, I'm not sure if it's in this presentation, might be in the next. But we'll talk about the, the, you know, the packet buffering that we have. Mm -hmm. As far as minimizing drops is also the congestion control. I mean, the, the first thing you want to do is try to minimize the amount of queuing that you have in the network, the amount of congestion you have in the network. So what you'd like to do is control the rate at which traffic is being injected into the network for, you know, from the source. So what we're doing here, the way this plays into that is that we provide you know, a very flexible telemetry that can be used for all these different congestion control schemes. Okay. So I'd say it's a combination of burst absorption, we'll talk about later, you know, plus this flexible telemetry. Mm -hmm. uh, we do also have, you know, groups within, you know, the switch team, you know, within Broadcom that work on this congestion control, the end-to-end -end congestion control. Okay. So I'd say that's kind of the biggest thing is that, you know, you really want to minimize the queuing delay within the network, you know, minimize you know, all the sources of, of, you know, of drops or congestion in the network by controlling what's in the source. And a lot of that is, you know, the type of, you know, the congestion, the telemetry you provide, you know, plus all of the, um, you know, the way that you buffer the packets within the network. So I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, is in terms of just a, a strategy for reducing congestion, mm -hmm. um, are you kind of in my brain, I'm thinking about strategies that focus on outside the chip. So things like you're talking about congestion yeah. control and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then the, then there are things that are specific to the chip. So, yeah. you know, the size of the buffer becomes very important. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so as far as what's in the chip, there are going to be things like, you know, the fact that we have a unified packet buffer. Mm -hmm. um, you take a look at some alternate architectures, they'll have a segmented packet buffer. Mm -hmm. So they're you know, much worse at handling. I'll actually show in a subsequent slide okay. that they'll get like, you know, we have like 10x better burst absorption. Okay. So if you do have a, you know, a short burst of like, you know, many packets that would like overload the network, you know, we can absorb those in the packet buffer and then stream those out at a more controlled rate. Um, there's also features that we have for, for routing and load balancing. So one thing I'll talk about is what we call cognitive routing. Um, so we add some intelligence to how you're load balancing. Um, so that's actually something you know within the switch chip where we can look at both the congestion of all the outgoing links. Mm -hmm. We can also look downstream from the switch mm -hmm. and then locally make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it kind of feels like you're kind of moving around in terms of that unified packet buffer. Does, mm -hmm. the, does the chip have its own intelligence to be able to say, okay, the the traffic looks like X, I need to size, you know, my buffers accordingly mm -hmm. and, and change the buffers, the buffer groupings, I guess, yeah, would yeah. be the best. So, I mean, we did, you can have different traffic classes, you can have different queues for different traffic classes. We can also prioritize things into low priority traffic, high priority traffic. And then we can dynamically, you'll have this, um, it's kind of getting into the weeds, but you know, we do have uh, like a minimum queue size you could have for each traffic class. Okay. And then on the fly, we can adapt the size of that queue for that particular traffic class. Okay. So you can do that either, you know, statically, where you say, I want to have, this is the minimum mm -hmm. queue size. You can say for high priority traffic, you know, like if I don't often have this high priority traffic, I will allow the switch, allow the queues for the low priority traffic to grow quickly or grow up to a certain point. But then once you see that the queues for the high priority traffic, you know, might get starved, you'll like dial that back down where you wind up having less buffering for low priority traffic. Okay. But yeah, there's a lot of both, you know, static where you could say, here are all the different traffic classes for all the type of packets coming through the network. And then dynamically, you can adapt how much of the buffering goes to low priority versus high priority. And you say dynamically, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, is that something like an operator has to go in and, and can say, oh, I want it. Today, I want it like this, you know, A is going to be this size and B is going to be this size. Mm -hmm. Or is it something that the chip has intelligence to say, oh, the traffic looks like this today and I'm going to, without operator intervention, mm -hmm. size it uh, according to the traffic? So what you would do is, I mean, the chip itself can on the fly make decisions about how to you know, allocate the, 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 the queue sizes. Okay. So, you know, the operator normally would say, you know, I know that there's certain high priority traffic, so I want to have like a minimum buffer size available. So just in case there is a burst of high priority traffic, I know I have that at least that minimum sure. queue size available. So there are some things that on the operator, operator standpoint, you would like set the parameters, but then on the fly in hardware, the, the, the chip would say, okay, I know that this is a high priority traffic, I'll just keep this minimum queue size available. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I know there's a big burst of low priority traffic since the, all the queues, you know, for all, you know, across the chip on all the ports are like, you know, if they're all drained. Now I know I have this large buffer that I can allocate for the low priority traffic. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's something the chip will do on the fly. Okay. I mean, normally the operators would want to say, I want to have a certain sure. minimum queue size. Sure. But then uh, dynamically you can vary that. How much, how much real estate are we actually talking about? If I wanted to allocate all of the real estate to one queue, how large does that get? Um, I don't think we've publicly discussed the size of the packet buffer, but you know, it, it just like you could have a very small minimum queue size, okay. and then you could have that full shared buffer that can go to you know whatever queue you want. Okay. So it's you know as many many megabytes. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Quick question for you on the operator control: mm -hmm. Is there a difference between the four and the five as far as how many controls you give the operators, or is it still the same number of manual controls? There are some new features as far as the way you handle burst absorption. Um, so if you're talking about the controls as far as like congestion control yeah, or as yeah. far as the admissions. Yeah, so there are some new features as far as, uh, you know, the dynamic allocation of buffers. So we do have some features that, um, you know, that adaptively with dynamic or adaptively, you know, you know, change the thresholding. So whereas before you would say that, you know, I'd have a you know, certain static, you know, minimum queue size limit. Um, you know, now there's a little bit more control in the Tomahawk 5 as far as how quickly it'll adapt and the way it sums up all the high priority traffic queues, the size of those, and how it like will dial back the low priority if they're starting to get starved. You mentioned that the three uh, big players here are, are taking different approaches to the congestion control. Could you give mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the short version of what their priorities are that are different and, and how you think the standardization of this is going to? play out? 
Uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, just, you know, the type of mix they're using, the type of traffics they have. Um, you know, is it a public cloud? Is it a private cloud? You know, if it's a private cloud, you have much more control over the type of applications. If it's public cloud, you have to be a bit more flexible because you don't know what sort of applications are being run on there. So, I mean, as far as priorities, you know, I think it's really what type of applications are the customers running? And then are you, you know, a meta that's doing more internal applications? You know, you're doing like an AWS that has more public cloud. Um, so one thing I want to point out here is just as far as, uh, you know, telemetry. So very flexible, both in-band and out-of-band telemetry. You know, we have six ARM cores on board that you can use for summarizing the statistics, packetizing them, sending those to a collector. We can do in-band telemetry where you insert, meta insert metadata into the packets as they traverse through the network. And that could be done for live traffic or just probes that you send through the, the network. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is the CERTES. So again, this is a really unique, it's a CERTES that's you know, designed for networking. So we can handle you know, up to four meter DAC. So four meter passive DAC, IEEE standard basically translates into about two meters. And I'll just flip to, let's see what's in here. Yeah, I'll flip to this next slide quickly to show you. If you're trying to cable a rack with two meter DAC, a little bit tough to see here, but I just showed here's a two meter DAC cable on one of the racks we have in our lab. But you can't actually cable a full rack, you know, using two meters. You know, you'd actually need to have on the order of like three meters or more. So, you know, with Tomahawk 4, the 30s on chip, we can drive this passive DAC directly. So it makes a, it gives you a lot more flexibility in the interconnect, also reduces power because now you don't have to have active components or repeaters within the network. And then again, so we can plug into standard front panel uh, plug, pluggable optics. And as mentioned before, we will offer uh, Tomahawk 5 with co-packaged optics. You know, we recently announced Tomahawk 4. Uh, there was actually in a partnership with Tencent where they said they will take our Tomahawk 4 with co-packaged optics, deploy that in their data center. And it will also offer co-packaged optics with Tomahawk 5. So exact same piece of silicon. You know, if you did want to mix and match in your network, where you had some links that were driven by you know, passive DAC, some that used long range or short range plug pluggables, and some places you wanted to use CPO. Again, it's the exact same piece of silicon, you know, exact same software you would use for all of those. You see the other major players looking at this as well, you think? There's a lot of interest in it. Um, you know, a lot of it, like the OIF, is spending a lot of time on these co packaged or near packaged optics. I mean, we're participating in that. Um, and yeah, you do see a lot of the major players that are looking into it. I mean, we are the first market. I think one thing that helps us again is the fact that we have all these technologies in house. So as far as optimizing the, the, you know, the silicon photonics with the linear components, you know, with the switch, you know, I think we're in a uni unique position to do that. So yeah, there's a lot of interest, but you know, as far as actually rolling it out, this is, you know, so Tomahawk 4 was the first really true CPO solution. Yeah, I saw, I saw that Tencent announcement, and it seemed like the, the power advantage there was pretty enormous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I mean, literally, we, we showed this at OFC this year, that if you look at a front panel pluggable versus the, the optics on this, you'll save half of the power. Yeah. I mean, that's demonstrable. We can show, that, show you that in the lab. Yeah. So at you know, the, just the optics level, it's 50% power. If you look at the complete system, so the whole box with the fans and the power supplies, you know, it's about 30% on the whole box that you'll save. And that's yeah. one of the primary motivating factors is that, you know, roughly we figure you'll save about 40% on the cost of the optics and about 30% on the system power. Yeah, that's, and that's a really big deal. I know the one company that I worked for is uh, we, we only got two thirds of a, of a DC site filled before we ran out of utility power and couldn't go any further. Yeah. So that, that kind of thing is pretty exciting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as for the high-end switches, it's the name of the game. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, latency, you know, what type of packet processing you, you do is important, but, you know, more and more you're getting limited by just the infrastructure power and then what can you cool within a rack. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of the customer benefits of a 51.2T chip. So if you wanted to construct a 51.2T switch out of previous silicon, so out of 25.6T, you'd actually need to have six chips. So on each of the four chips on the bottom, you'd have 12.8T going out to the front panel. And then each of those front panel ports needs to be able to connect to any other front panel port. So that's what the two top, top chips are. So when you double the bandwidth of the switch chip, you actually you know, decrease the complexity by you know, a factor of six. And what we show here is you know, one of the target systems that our customers are designing on the right bottom right here. So you'd get uh, you know, two RU, you'd have 51.2T, a uh, very common form factor we see for this is 64 OSFP ports.
Okay, and just wrapping up, Tomahawk 5 summary. So again, world's fastest switch chip. Um, it'll give you the highest performance AI ML networking. And again, we'll get into some details of how it does that in the next presentation. DAC reach, you know, again, this is something that often gets secondary consideration. You know, IEEE spec for this was two meters because that's what people believe you could actually do with, uh, you know, with 100 gig PAM4. We know some of our competition is struggling to get to a meter and a half or two meters. But again, if you do want to have the lowest power, most flexible interconnect, being able to connect things passively within the data center is still very important. And again, low power, uh, so you know, less than one watt per 100 gigabit per second. So typical power consumption for this is well below 500 watts. Hi, yes. Um, just to be clear, in regards yep. to the resource, yeah, <clears throat> in regards to the resource virtualization, um, mm -hmm. the, the, chip, the chip makes, because um, I, I was looking it up right now, when you said it leverages VXLAN, and I realized that using VXLAN, you can actually maybe make the admin move uh, servers to like an underutilized server. So mm -hmm. the chip makes it very fast. It makes like moving those servers very fast. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's basically so, you know, the chip itself doesn't physically, you know, you know, orchestrate the network and determine which workload is going to be moved. But, you know, within that, within this pipeline approach, if you decide you want to, you know, take a packet or you want to have a workload that's going to one server and have that moved to another server, that is done in real time at line rate on the chip. So there's going to be no additional delay. I mean, that is single pass as the packets are flowing through the pipeline. We'll do that VXLAN end cap or DCAP as needed. So no additional delay if you did want to move or if you decided you wanted to encapsulate a packet, move it onto a different server. Yeah. 